Hi, I'm Joshua Ruthford, and this presentation is called Procession, Black Representation, Precarity, and Performance in the Reconstruction Period. In the wake of George Floyd's death at the hands of Minneapolis law enforcement on May 25th of 2020, video footage of the murder was released and became a moment of national outrage. Incensed, thousands took to the streets in cities around the United States, protesting the ongoing issue of police brutality. During the first few weeks of protests, demonstrators started to topple Confederate monuments and monuments to other slave owners as a means of expressing their frustration with the racist systems that remain today. As much as this notion of toppling monuments is an exciting performative gesture of its own, what stood out to me amidst this backdrop of racial injustices was the power of these marches to proceed, the form of the procession. Live streaming made it possible to watch the protests in multiple cities at the same time. No matter how much they were tear gassed, pepper sprayed, or shot with rubber bullets, the protesters continued to put their bodies on the line. They continued to encounter and proceed, exposing themselves to violence. But why? Because the violence was a failure of the system, and by allowing the enactment of violence at the hands of law enforcement to be seen by millions around the world, Demonstrators were revealing that the violence of the Jim Crow South was not a thing of the past, but remains inscribed in our systems of justice. While many cheered at the same toppling of monuments, the, the monuments were also a breaking point for many moderate Americans who saw the destruction of public property as criminal action. The Trump administration, for instance, leapt at the opportunity to legislate vandalism of a monument as a felony offense, and the far right launched campaigns against even peaceful processions, smearing them as riots intent to destroy their cities and erase history. But what does it mean to proceed, despite these compounding obstacles? How is the form of the procession tied to both the history of Confederate monuments and to the ongoing protests? While the history of Confederate monuments does not reveal examples of topplings made by black demonstrators in the Reconstruction period, understanding the effect of economy out of which these monuments arose helped me understand the significance of the procession as a form of aesthetic intervention linked to black representation. Through Emancipation Day processions, Amer African American communities throughout the South found a means of representing themselves in the public sphere by seizing the power to enact their own freedom. These early processions were able to create a momentary break in the social construction of blackness. But why is it that more aren't historians aren't analyzing the procession as a form of aesthetic intervention? How are the processions a means of exercising power for African Americans during Reconstruction? And how can the procession better help us understand the process of social transformation and how it has failed in the past? While the field of performance studies and the theory of performativity were not part of academia, at the time of Reconstruction, I propose that using the theoretical foundations of this field to recontextualize early African-American processions as a form of aesthetic intervention might help art historians accept this idea. To begin, I propose using Fred Moten's understanding of the black radical aesthetic from In the Break. As Moten sees it, what's worth lingering on is in the break or in the cut. He is interested in what exists between the word and meaning. Using Frederick Douglass's narrative of Aunt Hester and how her scream made him recognize his own subjectivity as a slave, Moten looks to jazz, arguing that the breaks in free jazz reproduce the same oral effect of Aunt Hester's scream. He suggests that these vocalizations have a generative effect, which lingers in and opens up the meaning of the utterance. Moten finds that jazz opens up the same space which his writing seeks to linger in. Echoing Roland Barr's Moten denies the significance of the artist and performer, arguing instead that in the break there is a reenactment of this terror and violation for the spectator that means something beyond its linguistic and visual signifiers. The power of the black aesthetic for Moten lies in the way these oral moments can disrupt normative frameworks. While he acknowledges that the gender cut still plays a role, Moten invokes James Baldwin to suggest that African Americans also go through a racial cut. Baldwin addresses the moment in which black children look in a mirror and recognize their being as different from their white peers, the moment in which they acknowledge the construct of race in addition to that of gender. For Moten, this marks a double imposition through which black bodies are expected to en enact norms of both whiteness and heterosexuality. The intention of the black radical aesthetic, though, is generative, and it aims to produce a surplus of sensory information 
that intends to overwhelm the beholder's past understanding of a representational construct. Black performance, for Moten, is all about reenactment and recontextualization. By creating this generative space to linger on meaning, the black radical aesthetic, even in its failures, succeeds at calling into question the structures that led to its failure in the first place. It is through this understanding of failure that I see how Moton's theory can help us understand the procession as a manifestation of this black radical aesthetic. And looking at the ongoing Black Lives Matter protests, we can see that the use of the procession as a form of black representation continues to be central to activists today. With this in mind, what can we learn from the origins of the procession as a form of black representation in the United States? What systemic failures were represented by early African American processions? And can we consider the early performances to be successful, even in their failures? In his book, Cities of the Dead, Joseph Roach makes clear that the African-American procession had roots prior to emancipation in New Orleans by telling the history of slave funerals, which, fe which but because freedom did not truly exist legally under slavery, it is the processions during the Reconstruction period which interest me here. What was it that these processions intended to represent and how are they connected to the history of Confederate monuments? During Reconstruction, processions came to be a central form of public expression, not just for African Americans, but for many Americans going through a crisis of identity. Initially, processions were rooted in commemorating the dead from the Civil War. Both Union and Confederate sympathizers staged commemorative events, which included processions and hosted campaigns to build monuments, honoring the soldiers who fought. Many former Confederates and their families had not yet been readmitted to the Union in the early days of Reconstruction, so the fact that African Americans were allowed to share public funerary spaces and commemorate the army that had defeated the Confederacy led to escalating tensions. While Union organizers allowed African American participation, black participants were not generally given central roles, and so African Americans still struggled to find representation through their alliances with abolitionists. Because the financial inequities of slavery had not been ameliorated, the Confederate sympathizers still held financial power in the South, and we can see this tension manifested in the construction of Confederate monuments. Although the same drive to erect monuments existed within black communities, because of financial inequalities, funds raised by collaborating abolitionists usually outweighed those collected from former slaves. So each drive to install a monument of a black Union soldier was usurped, and instead the monument commissioned would represent Lincoln or Grant, leaving a distinct lack of African American representation in the form of monuments. A number of scholars allude to the significance of processions in recounting the history of Confederate monuments. While these narratives reveal some of the ways in which the terror and violation of slavery carried into the 20th century, most seem to identify these processions as failures. But I argue that processions celebrating Emancipation Day and Juneteenth formed as a distinct mode of black representation, which asserted rights to public spaces, freedom of expression, and political participation. But how does this connect with Moton's notion of the black radical aesthetic? For this, we can turn to Judith Butler, who suggests that the act of public assembly is a performative expression of freedom in itself, as it both enacts the freedom of expression and reveals how this freedom establishes the condition of precarity associated with protest movements. Butler poses public assembly as a means of amalgamating the distinct minority groups of the world into a united we through the act of assembly. What Butler's theory is missing in terms of racial performativity, for me, is elucidated in the example of second-line marching bands associated with New Orleans. The second line marching bands incorporate the black tradition of jazz music into the form of the procession here underscores Moton's point. Just as the moan of a mother in mourning conveys something in the break, Moton sees the growl of the jazz trumpet as a manifestation of this same orality. These processions reappropriate the history of the funeral processions as a mean of parody. The marching bands assembled and staged funerary marches ironically mourning the death of slavery and of white supremacy. It is at this point that I think Moton's notion of mourning, or Monin, as he refers to it, is essential. Moton suggests that rather than mourning, what black folks go through is Monin, a situation in which the mourning is rehearsed, so that it might be publicly performed. In the case of Emmett Till's mother, Moton argues that her decision to publicize the open casket funeral of her son, 
as he was found after being lynched, created a scenario in which the flaws of the system that allowed his death to go unchecked were recontextualized as a glaring example of social inequalities. It created a space within which individuals could recognize that the death of Till did not reflect the appropriate punishment to the actions of a child, but the dangers of a system of racial violence left unchecked. The very notion that resulted in Till's death was amplified through the process of Monin, in such a way that it called the structures of justice into question. Indeed, the very notion of the procession is tied to precarity. We can turn to a subset of the procession, the procession of arms, to better understand the role of precarity and vulnerability here. Knowing that they would be met with violence in the early years of the procession of arms took on a distinct significance of asserting black equality by revealing their ability to defend themselves. While the right to bear arms was part of the federal constitution, state and municipal governments still held the authority to limit the rights of their constituencies as they saw fit. So over the course of Reconstruction, laws were changed to prohibit black Americans from openly carrying arms in public. By putting their bodies into public spaces, participants in these processions were exposing themselves to violence and racism that lingered in their own communities. The objectification of black bodies through their commodification as slaves compounded with their subservient placement in the structural hierarchy of the United States so the normative expectations of white Southerners reinserted the dehumanization of African Americans in the establishment of the post-emancipation post structures. Media outlets in southern cities shared common efforts to criminalize the black male, suggesting that black men were trying to rape white women and that former slaves were plotting their revenge on the planters. Amidst their own crisis of identity, many white southerners saw African Americans as a threat. When this fear was validated by newspapers and politicians, it generated an effective economy in which the black body was valued less than the white body. Despite their freedom, vigilante groups like the Ku Klux Klan rose to prominence, abetted by local law enforcement, and initiated efforts to prevent African Americans from political and social participation in southern states. Here, we can see how the threat of white supremacist violence marks the very nature of the procession as one of precarity. While some abolitionists participated in Emancipation Day celebrations, even media outlets with union sympathies often represented the processions as a negative event. These sources, instead of reiterating the myth of the black rapist, might instead comment on the noise and odor of the events, aspects which revealed their inability to acknowledge the structures that resulted in the precarious living conditions of former slaves. Just as Moton has posed that there was a double consciousness associated with blackness, I read this as a sort of white double consciousness at play. The mediation of fear through the performative constitution of racist tropes gives us some understanding of the response of white Southerners to these demonstrations. So if we understand the procession in this respect as a relational artwork, then we can use these accounts detailing white Southerners' aversion and fear of black processions as an angle to understand how the beholder of the procession plays into this history. Mediation reveals how easily racist stereotypes and tropes can be circulated through repetition. But still, we need to read into the performative function of the procession in order to understand how these performances reappropriated such misrepresentations in presenting themselves not as violent or vengeful, but as members of a shared community. So let's linger in this space a moment longer. How do the processions of reconstruction leverage this in-between space in their efforts to recontextualize the social understanding of what it means to be both black and free. Keeping the idea of revulsion to sound and odor in mind, let's try to understand how objection has been corp incorporated into the black radical aesthetic in the work of Adrian Piper, who Moton focuses on in his conclusion. As Moton reads them, Piper's performances serve as the boundary of experience for her viewers. By objectifying her behaviors, Piper subverts the experience of viewing art from one in which the frame contains the experience to one in which the frame is the experience of the artwork. Piper's work is relational, just as these processions are. Piper takes power away from racist ideology in producing a sensory experience and surplus of the visual and linguistic dimension, generating a real experience to debunk the constructedness of the trope. In the same way that Piper's enactments triggered the sensibilities of beholders, those that experienced the emancipation processions documented the same sort of aversion. Both of these enactments reflect the back, black radical aesthetic insofar as their mode of intervention relies on the relational experience of the beholder.
when the beholder is able to understand that the structure of racism precedes their understanding of difference, and that the symptoms which are now seen as tropaic are not symptoms of an inherent difference, but symptoms of the failure of an American system to fulfill its promise of equality to all inhabitants. That is when the black radical aesthetic succeeds in producing, even for an instant, a break in which the racial cut is no longer visible, and black bodies are no longer disposable. Until then, Moton's work shows us that it's important to revisit the failures, but with the intention of highlighting what these interventions succeeded in representing. The American system of governance was originally built around a racial hierarchy, and until that structure of discrimination has been lingered on, acknowledged, and addressed, we will not be able to see how the failures of the past can help us better understand the way to proceed. Thank you for your time.